It's midnight and you're watching Nightline. I'm Norzi Patwanchi. These are the headlines. Amnus Kota Tampan Assemblyman Datuk Sharani Muhammad appointed new Pera MB. And government reactivates Maep's quarantine centre to treat foreigners. The Yang Di Pertuan Agung Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Billah Shah on Wednesday said that the intimacy, bilateral cooperation and diplomatic relations between Malaysia and Brunei need to be further strengthened for the common interest and economic well-being of both countries. His Majesty expressed confidence that the flow of trade and investment between Malaysia and Brunei could be further enhanced, especially the business cooperation in micro, small and medium enterprises sector. Istana Negara Comptroller of the Royal Household, Dato Ahmad Fadil Shamsuddin, said in a statement that Al Sultan Abdullah also expressed hope that Brunei could consider Malaysia's proposal to establish a reciprocal green lane to revive economic activities of the two countries following the impact of COVID-19. The King said this when he granted a farewell audience to the High Commissioner of Brunei to Malaysia, Dato Alaihuddin Muhammad Taha, and his wife, Datin Mariani Bongsu, at Istana Negara. Also present was the Raja Permaisuri Agong, Tunku Haja Azizah Aminah Maimunah Iskandaria. Al Sultan Abdullah expressed his gratitude to Dato Alaihuddin, who will end his service as envoy at the end of this month. His Majesty also expressed his appreciation to the Brunei government for its contribution in providing COVID-19 test kits to Malaysia. After six days, the Perak political crisis has come to an end after the Sultan of Perak, Sultan Nazrin Muizuddin Shah, gave his consent for the Kota Tampan Assemblyman, Datuk Sharani Muhammad, to be appointed as the 14th Menteri Besar of Perak. Comptroller of the Perak Royal Household, Datuk Abdul Rahim Muhammad, said the swearing-in ceremony will be held at 11am on Thursday at Istana Iskandaria, Kuala Kangsar. The statement read out by Dewan Negara Perak member Datuk Sri Muhammad Anwar Zaini further said that the decision was made by the ruler as he was convinced that Datuk Sharani has obtained the majority support of the state assemblyman. Okay, dengan titah perkenan, Duli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Sri Sultan Perak dan Redi Ruan adalah dengan ini saya dititahkan membacakan kenyataan daripada pejabat Duli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Seri Sultan Perak Darul Ridwan Duli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Seri Sultan Perak Darul Ridwan Sultan Nazrin Mu'izzuddin Shah Berpandukan Perkara 16 Fasal 2A Undang-Undang Tubuh Kerajaan Perak Darul Ridwan Pada Timbangan Baginda Yang Berhormat Datuk Sya'arani bin Muhammad Ahli Dewan Negeri Kota Tampan boleh mendapat kepercayaan sebahagian besar daripada ahli-ahli Dewan Negeri untuk dilantik sebagai Menteri Besar Perak. Earlier, Sultan Nazrin granted an audience to Perak Pass, Bersatu and Gerakkan lawmakers as well as an independent assemblyman who also submitted their statutory declarations to the ruler around 4.40pm at Istana Kinta. Datuk Sharani also had an audience with Sultan Nazrin in the afternoon. However, he refused to speak to the media when he left the palace after the meeting. <laughs> Earlier on Wednesday, in a joint press statement, Perikatan National PN that comprises PAS, AMNO Bersatu, said it has agreed to back Pera AMNO Chairman Datuk Sharani Muhammad as the 14th Pera Menteri Besar. The three presidents from BN, Bersatu and PAS, as well as the party's respective secretary generals, have also discussed the formation of the state government and agreed on other related appointments. Barisan National BN Chairman Datuk Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi had also apologised on behalf of Perak BN following the ouster of the State Bersatu Chairman Datuk Sri Ahmad Faizal Azumu as Menteri Besar. The statement further said that the three parties have agreed to strengthen the cooperation within the Perak PN coalition as well as at the national level for the sake of economic stability and the people's welfare. 
In the meantime, the 14th Berat State Assembly sitting has been postponed for seven days following the political crisis in the state. This was due to a requirement that the State Assembly sitting can only proceed after the appointment of the new Menteri Besa and at least four State Executive Council members. State Assembly Speaker Datuk Muhammad Zahir Abdul Khalid made the announcement at Bangunan Perak Darul Rizwan on Wednesday that the State Assembly sitting would only be convened next Wednesday. Memandangkan agenda seterusnya untuk membawa rang undang-undang perbekalan 2021 ke dalam Dewan tidak dapat diteruskan berdasarkan Undang-Undang Tubuh Negeri Perak Darul Rizwan Perkara 38 Kurungan 2 dan berdasarkan kedudukan semasa, maka persidangan ini akan ditempuhkan sehingga hari Rabu, 16 Disember 2020, jam 2.30 petang. Former Menteri Besar Datuk Seri Ahmad Faizal Azumu and other Bersatu Assemblymen except TT Serong Rep Hasnul Zulkarnain Abdul Munaim were not present at the sitting. Initially, the sitting was scheduled to be held between December 4th and 11th. However, it was adjourned on Friday after Datuk Seri Ahmad Faizal lost a motion of confidence vote. The following day, he resigned as Menteri Besar along with the state executive councillors. The Perak State Assembly has 59 assemblymen with AMNO, having the most seats at 25, followed by DAP with 16, Amanah and Bersatu with five seats each, PKR and PAS with three seats each, while Gerakan and Independent have one seat each. The government has decided to reactivate the COVID-19 quarantine and low-risk treatment centre at the Malaysia Agro Exposition Park or MAEBS in Serdang, Selangor, following a spike in positive cases. Senior Minister for Security, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, said the decision was also made due to the implementation of the Social Security Organisation or SOCSO programme to screen foreign workers. Skop operasi kali ini akan melibatkan pesakit COVID-19 kategori 1 iaitu tanpa gejala dan kategori 2 bergejala ringan dan akan hanya menempatkan pesakit bukan warga negara sahaja. Pengaktifan ini turut melibatkan pemindahan pesakit COVID-19 bukan warga negara daripada uh, ILLKM Sungai Buloh ke Maibs. Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said the centre has bed capacity of about 10,000, which would only cater to COVID-19 positive foreign patients. He added that based on the high capacity of the quarantine centre that will place foreigners, safety precautions will be enforced by the Malaysian Armed Forces and the police. The quarantine centre was previously used back on April 16th until July 15th this year and has treated 1,362 COVID-19 patients the majority of whom comprised foreigners at 86% as well as locals at 14%. <laughs> Meanwhile, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said the limit on the number of people sitting at a table for dine-ins at restaurants will now be based on table capacity with a one-metre physical distancing between diners. Kalau di restoran China, misalnya, meja bulat yang besar, boleh muat 10 orang. Mungkin ada penjarakan, mereka mungkin boleh duduk 6 orang dan sebagainya. Kita mendengar rungutan dan pandangan daripada orang ramai. Kadang-kadang mereka keluar bila kita buka kenderaan tidak ada uh, had tempat duduk lagi. Mungkin, mungkin mereka keluar satu keluarga enam orang dengan MPV. Jadi bagi mereka tidak menasabah kalau mereka diasing-asingkan keluarga mereka diasingkan duduk dua meja dan sebagainya. Jadi kita benarkan as long as ada penjarakan sosial. At the same media conference, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri also announced that three localities in Bentong Pahang will be placed under Enhanced Movement Control Order or EMCO from December 11th. The affected areas are Amber Court, Ria Apartment and Rumah Kongsi Kampung Semaud. He also said that mass screening will be carried out at Spectrum Sector A in Pulau Indah Selangor. He added this exercise starts on Wednesday and involves an estimated 45 companies, 102 premises and 1,200 residents, adding that the majority of them are not Malaysian citizens. 
Malaysia recorded 959 new COVID-19 cases and five more deaths on Wednesday. Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah said 953 were local transmissions with the remaining six cases imported. Mutakhir ini terdapat peningkatan kes positif COVID-19 yang ketara berikutan peluasan saringan ke atas para pekerja khususnya warga asing di Kilang dan juga tapak binaan. Kebanyakan kes positif COVID-19 ini adalah daripada kategori 1 iaitu individu yang tidak bergejala dan kategori 2 iaitu pesakit yang bergejala ringan. Selangor reported the highest daily cases with 277 cases, followed by Sabah with 203 cases and Kuala Lumpur with 129 cases. Sarawak, Trengganu, Putrajaya and Perlis recorded zero new cases. Four new COVID-19 clusters have also emerged over the last 24 hours. Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham said currently the number of active clusters is 187, of which 49 have reported an increase of infections on Wednesday. The highest number of infections in active clusters are the Tapa Bina Bulatan cluster with 162 cases, the Ria 30 cluster with 51 cases and Batu Tujo cluster with 39 cases. On the new deaths, all involved Malaysians aged between 60 and 82. Two deaths were reported in Sabah, two in Johor and one in Kuala Lumpur. Protecting and promoting the competitive process in Malaysia for the benefit of businesses, consumers and the economy. On Money Matters this week, we speak to Chief Executive Officer of Malaysia Competition Commission, Iskandar Ismail, on creating a conducive competition culture to make markets work well. This Saturday, 5 p.m., only on TV Tiga. We're going for a short break. When we return, four charged over Bangsa murder robbery. Five telecommunication companies were slapped with 15 compounds worth 750,000 ringgit for registering prepaid SIM cards without verifying user information. The Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, said the strict action was taken against the companies based on audits conducted in Pahang, Kelantan as well as Trunganu in August and October last year. In a statement on Wednesday, the MCMC said all the compounds were issued on December 4th to safeguard the interest of users from online fraud and scams which are on the rise. On top of the list with the highest number of compounds was DG Telecommunication Syndrome Bahad with five compounds worth 250,000 ringgit and Maxis Broadband Syndrome Bahad with four compounds worth 200,000 ringgit. This was followed by U-Mobile Syndrome Bahad with three compounds Pounds worth 150,000 ringgit, Tune Talk Syndrome Bahad, two compounds worth 100,000 ringgit, and YTL Communications Syndrome Bahad, one compound worth 50,000 ringgit. Registering a SIM card without verifying a user's information is an offence under the Communications and Multimedia Act, which carries a fine of up to 100,000 ringgit or two years as jail or both if found guilty. To date, the MCMC has issued a total of 70 compounds this year worth 3.45 million ringgit which was 16% higher compared to 2.9 million ringgit worth of compounds served for the same offence last year. Four men were charged in the Kuala Lumpur Magistrates Court on Wednesday with the murder of a former Malaysian Agricultural Research and Development Institute or MARDI Information Technology Director Dato Dr Wan Hassan Wan Ambung during a home invasion incident in Bangsa recently. No plea was recorded as the case comes under the jurisdiction of the High Court. 
of the accused aged between 22 and 27, comprising security guard S. Vikiswaran, dispatch rider P. Kogilan, electrician M. Ravindran and unemployed T. Sugu, nodded their heads to show that they understood the charge after it was read to them before Magistrate Wong Chai Sia. The four men, all unrepresented, were jointly charged under the penal code with committing the offence at Jalan Mambu, Bukit Bandaraya, between 3.35 a.m. and 4 a.m. on November 29th. They face the mandatory death sentence upon conviction. Meanwhile, at the Sessions Court, the four pleaded not guilty before Judge Israeli Zamsanusi to a charge of committing gang robbery at another house in Taman Tiara Titiwangsa Stapa a few hours later on the same day. They were alleged to have robbed a 33-year-old engineer, which involved losses of around 38,000 ringgit. No bail was allowed to all the accused. Both courts set March 9th for case mention. It was reported that 73-year-old Datuk Dr. Wan Hassan had fought off two robbers armed with machetes upon discovering they had broken into his double-storey bungalow. He died at the scene after he was slashed on his face and neck, while his wife, 70-year-old Sarifa Yusuf, was injured after she was slashed on her right shoulder. <laughs> Still to come on Nightline, Biden vows 100 million doses of vaccine distributed to America within his first 100 days in office. Welcome back. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden vowed on Tuesday to get at least 100 million COVID-19 vaccine shots in his first 100 days in office. He said his first months in office would not end the outbreak, but he would change the course of the virus in the country. The president-elect also urged the nation to mask up for 100 days and said he would make doing so a requirement in federal buildings and on planes, trains, as well as buses that cross state lines. Masking, vaccinations, opening schools. These are the three key goals for my first 100 days. But we'll still have much to do in the year ahead and sadly, much difficulty as well. The president-elect was attending a media conference in Delaware, during which he introduced his health team for when he takes office on January 20th. The announcement offered a telling split-screen counterpoint to an event being held at the same time at the White House, a vaccine summit where President Donald Trump boasted about what he called a monumental national achievement by drug companies to develop a vaccine for the virus in about nine months. He did not address the growing death toll or the death devastation across the country, but he used the occasion to suggest, yet again and without evidence, that people had tried to steal the election. In a related development, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, released documents on Tuesday that raised no new issues about the safety or efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. The U.S. regulators then released their first scientific evaluation and confirmed it offers strong protection, setting the stage for the government to greenlight the biggest vaccination effort in the nation's history. Uh, vaccine is effective. It's effective uh, overall. It's effective in people over 55. It's effective, just as effective in people under 55, uh, effective in, in African Americans, in Hispanics, in whites, in Asians. Uh, so it's, it's a consistent effect and um, it's safe. Uh, the, it does cause sore arms. It causes some malaise and, and uh, you know, feeling uh, muscle ache and, and pains, that sort of thing. This comes a month after Pfizer and German partner BioNTech SE claimed that their coronavirus vaccine's two-dose regimen was 95% effective against the outbreak and had no major safety issues before asking the FDA for emergency use authorization. It is also reported that FDA is scheduled to hold an all-day virtual meeting on Thursday to recommend to the agency whether the vaccine should be authorized for use in people ages 6 and up. 
A cruise to nowhere of Singapore was cut short Wednesday after a passenger tested positive for the coronavirus in a blow to efforts to revive the hard-hit industry. The voyages starting and ending at the city-state with no stops began last month, marking the resumption of cruises after a month-long hiatus due to travel restrictions. Early Wednesday morning, however, the holiday calm was shattered by an announcement the cruise was being cut short after an 83-year-old passenger had tested positive Following the discovery, officials have identified and isolated all guests and crew who had close contact with the guest. And so far, each of those individuals have subsequently tested negative for the virus. The Singapore Tourism Board added that all on-board leisure activities were halted and passengers were asked to stay in their cabins. Passengers and crew will remain on board until contact tracing is complete and will undergo mandatory virus tests before leaving the cruise terminal. The vessel had 1,680 guests and 1,148 crew on board. Indonesia held nationwide regional elections Wednesday with more than 100 million voters expected to cast a ballot despite warnings the poll would worsen the nation's COVID-19 crisis. The archipelago of nearly 270 million, the world's third biggest democracy and fourth most populous nation, previously delayed the vote originally set for September as it struggled to contain soaring infection rates. Hundreds of hopefuls are vying for 270 positions, including regional governors, district heads and mayors, including President Joko Widodo's eldest son. However, at least five election candidates have reportedly died so far and more than 1,000 election agency staff were infected ahead of voting day. China has tested more than a quarter of a million people for the coronavirus after a handful of new cases were detected in the southern city of Chengdu. According to authorities, schools and kindergartens in the Pidu district, where the cases emerged, have closed, with students and teachers to quarantine and be tested for the virus. As of Tuesday, 255,200 residents in the city had been swabbed for the COVID-19 tests, with six confirmed cases and one asymptomatic. Patient. The United Arab Emirates on Wednesday officially registered the coronavirus vaccine produced by Chinese drug giant Sinopharm, saying it was 86% effective according to analysis of third phase trials. The health ministry, however, did not elaborate on how it would now be used. The vaccine has been undergoing third phase trials in the Emirates since July and it was approved for emergency use for healthcare workers in September. Analysis shows it has no serious safety concerns. Now let's take a look at the highlights in Malaysia's main newspapers for Thursday, December 10th. The New Straits Times and Berita Harian both focus on the political crisis in Pera, which has been solved. After a few days of deadlock, Amnus Datuk Sharani Muhammad is expected to be sworn in as the Menteri Besa of Pera on Thursday. And on the front page of Malaysia's best-selling Malay newspaper, Harian Metro, is an article on a businessman who lodged a police report claiming he was threatened by MACC officers. And finally, headlining the Malaysian Reserve is a report on Sarawak viewing the oil settlement agreement with Petronas as progress. Don't forget to get your copies or subscribe to the online newspaper. As we wrap up Nightline this time around, let's take a look at this incident where helmets saved two bikers' lives after they fell underneath a truck in eastern China. With that, I'm Norzi Patwanchik. Thank you for watching and stay safe.